The following broadcast is a presentation of Mount Zion Media Ministry. Verses 1 through 5 uh, from the um, um, chapter 2 in the book of Revelation. Amen. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These things are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its presence. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And the subject of the sermon today is you don't love me like you used to. You don't love me like you used to. Yeah. I um, remember when I first started preaching, one of the advice that the elder preachers gave me and my mama was don't preach out of the book of Revelation. You're too young. You, you don't know enough yet. <laughs> and, uh, and it speaks to the idea that all of this mystery surround this book because as you read it, you see all these symbols, all these allegories, and people are trying to figure out what they mean. And while that is true on the one hand, on the other hand, there are portions of this book that are as simple and straightforward as they can be. And I fall down on the side of until I understand what I don't know, I'm going to do what I do know. And there's enough in this book that we do know that we don't have to fight and fuss and wait until we understand that we don't know. And one of the things we do know is that in chapters 2 and 3, God instructs John out on the Isle of Patmos to write letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And all of Revelation is nothing more than a letter written by John to be circulated among these seven churches. And let me say to you that while John wrote the letter, the words are not John. The words are the words of Jesus Christ. When you read chapter 1, you, you see the instructions from the Lord. John, what I am going to show you is what was, what is, and what is to come. And I want you to write it just like I tell you to and send it to the churches. The reason it is called the book of Revelation because it is a, a recording of what was revealed to John by Jesus Christ and then share it with those of us who have an ear to hear. And I emphasize when you read it, you keep hearing that, let him that hear, that has an ear to hear, hear, because everybody can't get it. But to those of us who can get it, it's right there for us. Right there for us. And it's communion today, and so I, I don't want to uh, keep you long, and so let me just jump right into it. 
these letters have a pattern. They begin with compliments about a particular church, and then God expresses his complaints. He doesn't just say all is good or all is bad because there's never a situation in the body of Christ where everything is either all good or all bad. In the worst of us, there's some good. And in the best of us, there's some bad. And so God is kind enough to deal with both. And so let me introduce this writing to you and, uh, and then uh, make a few points about how we connect with this and then I'll be through. Look, look, look at, at your Bibles, if you will, at verse 1. When God writes the letter, he, he shares with John who he wants to deliver the letter delivered to, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. I had time I'd tell you more about Ephesus, but just know it's a lot like Albany. And, and so it's important that you understand who the letter is addressed to. The angel of the church represents not some angelic being, but it is a first century uh, term in the context of the language of, of the Christian community that day that represents the pastor, the overseer, or bishop, whichever name you want to use, of that local church. Ephesus has a senior pastor, and the letter is delivered to him. It wasn't delivered to the Sunday school superintendent or the teacher. It wasn't delivered to any particular ministry, deacon's ministry, deaconess ministry, to the ushers, to the musicians, to the minister. It is, it is sent to the senior pastor who is believed to be Timothy. And, and, and brothers and sisters, that speaks to the fact, Old and New Testament, God does not send instructions to committees. God does not send instructions to leaders who are not responsible for his whole church. Next thing I want you to notice is this. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven candlesticks. Who, who, who is that? Well, if you go back to chapter 1 and verses uh, uh, 17 and 18, I'm sorry, 17, 18, 19, you will see who that is. Here it is. When I saw him, John is saying, when I saw him, the person who was talking to me, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And behold, the keys of death and Hades, I got them. And, and he's explaining now part of the vision that John saw. I told you there's a lot we don't know, but there's some stuff we know. We can go what we know. And, and look as he explains what John saw. He said, write therefore what you have seen, what is now and what will take place. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand uh, and, and the seven golden uh, lampstands you saw me in the midst of, here it is. The seven stars are the seven angels, the pastors in my right hand. And then the seven lampstands, they are the seven churches. Now, go back to verse 1, and this is why it's important that you understand what that mystery is. God is saying, you tell the church at Ephesus that the one, me, first, the last, the beginning, the end, was dead, now alive, I am in the midst of your church. And I got your pastor in my hand. But not only do I need you to see him in my hand, but I need you to see that I am in your midst. I'm not up yonder. You ain't going to me by and by, but I am with you right now. That's going to be important in, a, in just a minute. Now look at verse 2. The compliments come. Listen. He says, I know your deeds, I know your work, I know your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. Let me, let me, let me, let me just open that up for you. He says, because I am in your midst, 
I really do know what you are doing. You don't have to tell me. I don't need to see the minutes of your meeting. In fact, I know what you do in the meeting, before the meeting, and after meeting. I know your deeds, and he's commending them. I know how hard you work. I see how you've been persevering and just toiling and laboring for me. And then I, I appreciate the fact that you don't tolerate wicked folk. Break that down, Pastor. I see how hard you work, but I also see how even in the church you've got some wicked people who like to gossip, who like to talk trash, who like to just keep up mess, but you don't tolerate them. When they call you to talk about another member, you say, hold up, I don't, I don't do that. But if you insist on doing that, hold up, let me do a three-way call so the person you're talking about can hear what you're saying firsthand because I'm going to try to tell them, but in case I get it wrong, let me just get them on the line. He said, I see you. You, you don't tolerate evil and wicked folk in their activities. Those of you that have people calling you with gossip and mess, they do that because they know you tolerate it. People know where the trash cans are. And they bring the trash to the trash can. There's stuff that I don't ever hear because folk, folk know better than bring the junk to me. And, 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 and I have some, some standards. And, and so, for example, Ernest over there, see, I don't care if it's my mama. She can't talk to me about Ernest. So, mama, mama, you, you, you can't talk about Ernest like that. Because I don't tolerate. See, see, see. They know who to get with before the meeting to get the mess started. But he says, I know you, you, you don't tolerate that kind of stuff. And I appreciate that about you. And then he says, you, you don't just take people's word. You, you, you try the spirit by the spirit. So you got some false apostles who've been coming around. And you don't just take their word for it, but you test them. And when you find out they're not true apostles or true whatever they're supposed to be, you cut them loose. You don't play. And he says, I, I appreciate that about you. And then verse 3, I understand that, uh, that, that serving me will cost you, but you have persevered. You've endured hardships for my name's sake. You've had to go through some st stuff to serve me, but you endured it, and you've not grown weary, and I appreciate that about you. Verse 4, but in spite of all of your work, you don't tolerate evil people, you don't, you know, testing these apart, but, I, but here's my complaint. Got one thing against you, you have forsaken the love you had for me at first. Ooh-wee. That's, that's, that's hard right, right there. Uh, and this is what he's saying. You don't love me like you used to. He's saying that when you, maybe it was when, when they first came to him, when they first got saved, they loved him like he wanted to be loved. But he says, now you don't love me like you did at first. And I need you to repent and come back to loving me like you used to. Yeah. Let me say that again. You don't love me like you used to. I see the work you're doing and I applaud you, but I want something more than that. I want you to love me like I want to be loved. But pastor, there's a contradiction. These people are serving, they're working hard and they're they're giving their all to the church and to the work of ministry and they're doing hardship for him. But how you say they don't love him? Because you can love him and do all of those things for the right reason. But you can also do those things and it not be connected to love for him. You can go through the motions and do what you do out of obligation 
and not because of love. And he's saying, I don't want duty-bound obligation. I want work that flows out of love. I want a commitment that flows out of love. Y- y'all not catching it yet, so let me make it plain for you. Some of you in here now, don't you dare raise your hand. Don't, don't you dare look. And, and some of you watching me on live stream, don't, don't, don't you smile. Don't you, you just get, you better get a blank look on your face. You are married to somebody and you're in the house with them, but you don't love them like you used to. And you are going through the motions of doing the things that married folk do. But you are not doing it out of love. You're doing it out of obligation. And, and, while, and while you may think that the other person is not aware of what you're doing, they know there ain't no love in that. They know you're not coming home every night because you want to come home. But you're only coming home out of obligation. In fact, the only reason you hadn't gone to divorce court is there's something in you that says, I'm supposed to stay here. And so you're just staying out of obligation. There's, there's something in you. You're doing your wife to do this. But not because you want to. You're doing your husband to do this. But it ain't because you want to. Yeah. You make it love based on the calendar. Hmm. Look at here. It's it been back. See that I, I marked it right there on the calendar. It been back two months right there. Good the time us do something now, ain't it? <laughs> make it plain, Sam. I'm 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 trying my best. And, and don't you remember how it was at first? I'm, I'm just trying to get you where I want you to be. Then I'm coming back to this text. Uh, how attentive you were. But you don't pay attention now. Don't you remember how you used to look every time they walked by? And don't you remember how you always gave them something to look at when you walked by? But now you don't care what they see. And he don't care if he don't look. And, 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 and so if, if, if you went missing and the police said, sir, uh, what did she have on when she left home? Oh, uh, I think, I think it was some pants cause what color, uh, uh, I, I don't know, did, did she have on a hat? Uh, was she wearing a, a skirt? I don't, I don't know. I didn't see it. But she walked right by you. She told you to have a good day. You told her to have a good day. But the truth is, you saw but you didn't see. Because you don't love her like you used to. And she gave you nothing to remember because she don't love you. Like she used to. And you know I'm married folk. I'm talking about y'all too. Yeah, y'all. You, you don't love them like you used to. Yeah, you. Y'all don't want me to talk about you, do you? I, ain't gonna, I, I won't talk about you because I got to go, but yeah. But, but it's, it's clear. It's clear when the love is gone. It's, 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 it's a difference. And in the way you set that plate on the table when the love is there. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> when the love was there, that, it, was, it was a whole, whole lot different. So, so, and so God is saying, I see you doing all this 
But what I want from you is love. See, because, listen at me, church people. You can do works and you end up loving the work, but not the one who called you to work. Why you preach so much? I just love preaching. I love singing. I love ushering. And so you're in love with the work. But not the one who called you to work. And, 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 and that's not what it's supposed to be. Listen at my church folk. You, you can come to church out of obligation. Why are you going to church? Today? Well, it's my time to usher. It's my time to sing. It's my time to be security. I got the priest today. I got... And so that's the only reason you're here. If you wasn't on duty, whatever that is today, come on, tell the truth. You wouldn't be here. The only thing brought you here is your work, whatever that is today. Not all of you, but some of you. But when you're in love, hmm, don't, don't care if you're on duty today or not, you're going to show up. Um, listen at verse 5 he said consider how far you fall and repent and do the things you did at first if you do not repent I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place tell you something people it's dangerous to stop loving God when he says to you if you don't repent if you don't change this thing I'll come to you and remove the lampstand. Remember, the lampstand represents churches. He's saying, I'll take this church away from you. And he's not talking about, I'll take the building. He's not talking about, I'll stop you from having church. But what he's saying is, I'll be gone. And the authority that has been given you to have a church in my name, you will lose that. And so you can still gather on Sunday and get the best singers and musicians in the world, get a decent preacher, and all these ushers and go through the motion, but it's just that going through the motion because there's no power here. The person of Jesus Christ is not here. It's just us. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I don't want to be in a church with just us. I love all y'all, but I don't want to be in a church where it's just us. I, as your preacher, I don't want to preach depending on my gifts and talents because it's not enough to be effective to do what God has called it her to do. I believe we've got some of the most gifted singers in the world. I've said again before I said again, I'll put them up against anybody, but I won't put them up against anybody if they don't have the anointing and the authorization of the Holy Ghost because that's where it come from. Like I saw Kovaleski stood behind a mask some, somewhere in here today, but, uh, uh, but Kovaleski and I had this in common. Uh, I passed the church where we, at church, our pastor, we had the same a musician, and they had the same musician at his church. And uh, he couldn't play but one chord. It was the same chord for every song. <laughs> I mean, he, he just had one little thing, and it, it was for every song. But let me tell you something. The anointing would catch hold of that man in that piano with that one, one chord. <laughs> and we had some church up there in Dawson, Georgia. Yeah, see, when Alon Alonzo started playing, I know what we're getting ready to hear. But I had to wait because <laughs> it was the same thing to introduce every song. But in spite of his weakness to play, God used him in a mighty way. And so, and, 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 and so, so, so what do we do? We got to go back and start loving God. And let me just give you um, according to the Bible because it doesn't say how they stopped loving him. So let me just give you part of God's love language from the Bible. And then we'll understand what we need to do in case we are guilty of not loving him like we used to. Uh, first of all, he was asked one day, what is the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And so that says to us then that God wants us to love him with all of us. God wants us to be all in. God doesn't want us here worshiping, loving on him with our mind, but our soul is committed somewhere else. God doesn't want me to use all of my physical strength out in the world, worship and serving something out there, but come to him and I'm exhausted and have no physical capacity to love on him. 
my heart, the soul of my emotions, and my will. God, God wants me to love him out of a heart that chooses to love him. And so when I love him, it's not because somebody is forcing me, but it's because out of the will of my heart, I am loving on him. And then I put my heart and my mind together. That is both emotion and thought. I'm not emotional. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You better find something somewhere. Make it plain. I'm, I'm just trying to help you. And so God is saying, I, I don't need the chosen frozen. I need you to love me with your heart. I want some emotion. I want a will. I don't want you to have to be pumped and prime, but you choose to love me and you got a mind to connect with it. When I think of the goodness of God and all he's done for me, my soul cries out. And that soul, that's my inner consciousness. And so God says, I want you to love me with all of you. I want you all in. And then, and, and, and then in that same verse, Mark 12, 29, when he, when he, when, when he talks about loving him, with all, he says, the first of all commandment, which means God wants to be the priority. When, when the work becomes the priority, when some other relationship becomes the priority, when you love God like he wants to be loved, you make God number one. Nobody who's, you know, really together, you don't want to live all your life knowing that you're not a priority to the person who loves you. Somebody in here mad with their spouse now because it's clear you're not his priority. It's clear you are not her priority. Even the children, the children, uh, 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 when they are young, these babies are right here. When you get in their presence, they want to be your priority. If you put your attention anywhere else, they're saying, come back, come back. I, I want to be number one. I want to be number one. And God is saying, I got to be number one. So if we're going to love him, we've got to love him with everything that we are. And then we've got to give him the first place. Amen? All right. Let me run through them fast. Uh, the next thing is, when you love him, you long to be in his presence. David said, Psalm 42, 1, 2, as a deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you. My God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go meet God? See, when you're in love with him and you're loving him like you're supposed to, you want to be in his presence. It doesn't matter if you singing, preaching, or praying, or working or not. When you come to worship, you just want to be in the presence of the Lord. You want to be close to Him. Thanks for watching. Be blessed and continue walking in the light.